Now there are many definitions of what mindfulness means. Acceptance, non-reactive awareness, a wide open awareness. In fact, the definitions are so many that one writer said that mindfulness is this very mysterious quality. It's this one thing that does so many different things for the mind. It wasn't the nature of the Buddha to deal in mysteries. And for him, the definition of mindfulness was very simple. The ability to keep something in mind, hold something in your memory. And the question is, why is it important to develop that quality? Why do you need to develop this ability to keep something in mind? Well, the answer is suggested by someone who actually had a different definition of mindfulness. This one teacher defined mindfulness as this basic awareness or bare awareness in the present moment. He went on to say, mindfulness is not hard, it's remembering to be mindful that's hard. And that's the point right there. We tend to forget what we're doing as we're meditating. We're here to train the mind, to understand how the mind creates suffering for itself and how it can learn not to create suffering. And all of a sudden we find ourselves running restaurant reviews through the mind, plans for tomorrow, memories of childhood coming through, and say, boy, I haven't thought about that for a long time. Let's look into that. And five minutes later you wonder, well, wait a minute, I'm supposed to be here meditating. The ability to step back and watch the mind is central to the path, and that's what we keep forgetting to do. We tend to plunge in. The Buddha said that he got on the right path to practice when he realized that his thoughts were of two types, thoughts that led to suffering and thoughts that led away from suffering. Thoughts that were unskillful and thoughts that were more skillful. So he said he was going to divide his thoughts into two types, which meant that he had to step back and look at them to see what quality of mind was motivating the thought. If there was sensual desire, ill will, thoughts of cruelty, he knew that that kind of thinking was going to be unskillful and he'd have to hold it in check. If the thoughts were devoid of those qualities, then they were okay. And he can allow the mind to think in those directions. So we have to remember to do is to step back. So we can see where is this particular thought leading? Is it something I want to jump into? Or is it something I have to hold in check? So in other words, you can't really jump into any of your thoughts. You have to watch them as a cause and effect process. So you can see how they're skillful, how they're not, where they're coming from. If you're in the thought, you can't see this. Or if you're reacting to thought in a way that says, I don't like this thinking, I'm ashamed of myself to be thinking this, I'm going to put it into denial, I'm not really thinking this thought, or maybe it's not so bad after all, then you've left the training. Because we are in training here. And even though there may be a pleasure in following some of the thoughts, we have to remind ourselves, okay, it's a pleasure you have to forego for the time being. Because you really want to understand why does the mind cause suffering. If you don't step back and look at the mind's thoughts, its thinking processes, you're never going to solve this problem. So in the same way that an athlete has to forego certain pleasures while he or she is in training. While we're in training, we have to forego the pleasure of plunging into our thoughts and riding them off into who knows where. Notice also that when the Buddha said he was able to look at his thought processes, he didn't just leave them there. If it was going to be unskillful, he had to hold it in check. This is where right effort comes into the practice. I read recently someone saying that right effort and right mindfulness are two radically different practices. 
But the question is, well, why did the Buddha put them together in one path? And how did he say that right effort led to right mindfulness and their right mindfulness helped right effort? They're supposed to go together. And the Buddha's image of mindfulness is of a gatekeeper and a large fortress. He has to be very careful who he's letting in and who he's not letting in. He has to be able to recognize who's the enemy, who are the friends. In the same way, once you see that a particular line of thinking is unskillful, you've got to figure out some way to undercut it, to go back through the causal process and find where is it that in the mind that you can actually cut off that kind of thinking, not get pulled into it. You have to understand where is the gratification in that thinking? What are you getting out of it as you think it? And when you can develop a sense of dispassion for that gratification, that's when you're able to let go of it. There's a passage in the canon where a group of monks are going to go abroad to one of the outlying districts of India. And before they go, they say goodbye to Sariputta. And Sariputta says, they're going to be intelligent people. They're going to ask you, what does your teacher teach? How are you going to answer them? So the monks ask Sariputta, well, what would be a good answer? And Sariputta's answer is interesting. Our teacher teaches the abandoning of passion and desire. The follow-up question is, passion and desire for what? And for the five aggregates, form, feeling, perceptions, fabrications, and sensory consciousness. And there's another follow-up question. What danger does your teacher see in having desire and passion for those things? He says, when you have desire and passion for those things, you suffer. You do things that cause suffering. And if you abandon that passion and desire, okay, you put an end to suffering. So notice Sariputta's answers here all have to do with activities, the things you do. The Buddha recommends doing something. He doesn't say that our teacher teaches four noble truths, or our teacher teaches emptiness, or that not self. He says, you've got to learn how to undo these activities that cause suffering. Learn how to abandon them. So that's what we're working on. We, the mind is constantly active. It's shaping its experience. It's not a blank slate that's just receiving impressions from outside. It's actually trying to make sense of things, trying to figure out some way of manipulating experience so you can get pleasure, happiness out of it. And so you want to look at the ways it's doing this that are actually leading to the other direction, that are actually causing suffering. So all this means you have to learn how to watch the mind, step back from it. The reason we develop concentration is it gives the mind a good place to stay, so it can actually watch these things. We stay with the breath because it gets you out of your thought worlds. You're there with the physical sensation of the breathing. And not only that, you can work with the breath, so it becomes a good, comfortable place to stay. It gives you a sense of ease, a sense of well-being, so that you don't have to go for the gratification that comes from pursuing your thought worlds. You're not hungry all the time. So we work with the breath. And at the same time, in working with the breath, we begin to get an insight into how we are shaping our experience and how to do it well. We develop our sensitivities, our powers of judgment. So we can become more clearly aware of where we're causing suffering, why we're doing it, and how we can learn not to do it. So to stay with this training, you have to develop your powers of mindfulness, the ability to keep reminding yourself we're here to learn about the mind. 
this producer of happiness and pain. To see why every time it does something it wants happiness out of its actions, but many times it gets the opposite result. Why is this happening? What does it not understand? And if you forget yourself, forget why you're here, you suddenly find yourself going back into your old habits. And you miss the opportunity. You got some really good training. And it's often the case that the mind has this ability to block things out from itself. When it's about to do something that part of it knows is unskillful, but the other part wants to do it. And so we set up these walls in the mind, these walls of forgetfulness. This is precisely what we're trying to bore through. So we can see the connection between an action and its result, and the connection between the, the thought and the motivation for the thought. And as we step back, on our foundation of the breath. We can develop the dispassion that enables us to let go of all the different causes of suffering and stress in the mind. So this is why we need to develop mindfulness, and why this quality of keeping something in mind is such an important part of the path. So if you find yourself tempted to go jumping into your plans for tomorrow, remind yourself you planned tomorrow. You've planned many, many tomorrows without really noticing what you're doing. Isn't it time that you step back and gained a sense of what is this going on? What is this process? This is only when you step back that, as the Buddha said, you begin to see things you never saw before, realize things you never realized before, and taste a freedom that you've never tasted before. That's the potential of the practice, and that too is something you want to keep in mind.